It was no part of our plan to give prominence to writers who are not, in the accepted sense, authors. But Mary E. Bryan has contributed so essentially to the tone and stamina of Southern literature, and her productions are so vital, we feel that it would be defrauding the South to withhold a full recognition. Mrs. Bryan has retired for some time from regular service, but she has written enough in her best vein to fill more than one volume. And now we at least hope that she will collect these waifs and give them a, a local habitation and a name in literature. The surface of life with all its varying phases is apparent in her ready perception, while her penetrative intellect is busy with the pearls that lie beneath. Through all her prose occur flashes of poetic thought, while her poetry is alive with true inspiration. We predict for her a brilliant and permanent place among the gifted and victorious of her sex and land. But our prophecy falters with heavy misgivings when we remember how very few out of the multitude of wealthy poetic natures with happily organized brains and delicately attuned sensibilities possess that indomitable tenacity of will, that persevering, assimilative, self-fired, and self-criticizing application to study and practice required to conquer the disheartening obstacles in the way of literary art and experience and to win the prize of enduring fame. Thousands aspire, hundreds fitfully struggle, scores meritoriously work, alas, but one or two here and there through all consecrating devotedness and toil succeed. We hold high hopes for Mary E. Bryan's permanence in literature's palace, and for an example, we shall exert here from her exquisite When We Shall Meet Again, which contemplates a life after death. <clears throat> Look on the hour when we shall meet again, yet we shall meet. Listen. One winter day, standing where late the gentians were abloom? You said when life's red current ebbed away that we should, like the flowers, sink to a tomb of dust and nothingness upon the breast of earth whence we had drawn our sustenance, and that the sleep would be eternal rest. And then you met my anxious upward glance and smiled and said that the mysterious scheme which in the world's dim ages priests had spun of life beyond was but a dotard's dream. And I believed you, for you were the sun to my unbudding soul. But that is past. I have talked with my soul in the still hours and with bared brow prayed in the temples vast which nature rears, and when the dreaded power of death had stamped pale foreheads, I have knelt to catch the meaning in the dying eyes, and so have solved the mystery. I have felt your teachings false. The spirit never dies. There is a world beyond and we shall meet. The thought falls like a dead flower on my heart. Meet only once at the dread judgment seat. Clasp hands, look in each other's eyes, and part, and part forever. Oh, by all the years my soul has kept thy memory enshrined, by all my burning prayers, and by my tears, and by the love to long despair resigned, I charge thee, let that single glance be kind, full of unuttered love as dying breath breathed out in kisses, where the arms entwined shall soon be severed by the grasp of death. The gulf that then shall part us is more deep and dark than death. Oh, let that last look be one of immortal love, that I may keep its sacred memory through eternity.
night, all silent dreaming, the earth in slumber lies, while far above, high in the heavens gleaming, slowly the stars night in memory's vision from happy days of yore comes starry dream of bliss departed forevermore forever Der meine Seele in tiefster Einsamkeit sind stille, stille Sterne.